Chapter 7 of Dave Dashaway, The Young Aviator, by Roy Rockwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Robbed. Well, that's the hardest part of it over and done with, declared Dave as he walked into the railroad depot at Brompton. The youth felt pretty much encouraged. His foot had mended, he had earned ten dollars, and had won a good friend. He had got safely away from Brookville by a route his pursuers would never suspect him of taking. More than all, best of all, spoke Dave with longing and satisfaction, I'm well started for Fairfield and the airships. Dave found the depot almost deserted. A few travelers were nodding on the benches in the passenger room waiting for a late local train going north. The ticket office was closed, but the depot policeman was on duty. Dave approached this official. What about a train for Fairfield? he spoke. Last one gone two hours ago. When is the next train? 8.15 a.m. Dave was disappointed. That was nearly a third of a day ahead. It would be a long wait, but he decided to make the best of it. He selected a snug seat in a dark corner and began to nod before he was aware of it. Here, route out, sounded a gruff voice in his ear, and he was shaken rudely. Oh, yes, I was asleep, mumbled Dave, recognizing the depot policeman. Going to close up now. No more trains either way tonight, he said. But I'm waiting for the Fairfield train. Can't do it here, against the rules. Come back in the morning. Where can I go? Why, to a hotel, of course. There's lots of them within a stone's throw. Dave got to his feet and out of the depot. He had unexpectedly received a great deal more money than it would take him to get to Fairfield. He treasured his little hoard, though. The idea of saving the price of a night's lodgings had pleased him. What do I care for a bed, he told himself as he came out of the depot into the starry night. I can sleep anywhere. And Dave made for the deep entrance to a store and sat down upon its step. Almost instantly, however, a policeman in uniform stepped out of the deep window of a neighboring doorway on the lookout for stragglers. You'll have to move on, Sonny, he said. All right, assented Dave with a comical smile. I wouldn't hurt one of those iron steps, though. Dave walked on till he came to a big building. It bore the sign Empire Hotel. Glancing in the lobby with its elegant appointments, Dave shrugged his shoulders and walked on. Now that's too rich for my blood, even if I do feel like a millionaire, he smiled. Something more modest for me. Finally, Dave reached a respectable-appearing hotel that looked second-class and cheap. He entered the lobby and went up to the clerk's desk. "'How much do you charge for a night's lodging?' he asked. Fifty cents. "'I guess I'll stay, then. "'Got any baggage?' "'No, sir. "'Any references?' "'I should say not,' Dave told himself." and he walked away when the clerk had explained that they never took any transients without baggage or an introduction from a responsible party. Dave sauntered about leisurely now. He made up his mind to walk about all night. At the end of an hour, however, the unfamiliar stone pavements began to remind him of his weak ankle. He noticed an illuminated sign running out from a shabby-looking building. It read, Rooms, twenty-five and fifty cents. Well, that sounds all right, reflected Dave, and he ascended a stairway lighted up by a smoking oil lamp at its top. A drowsy, sleepy-eyed young man was lounging in a broken chair behind a desk. At its side were a lot of pigeonholes and some holding keys. I want to stay here all night, stated Dave. No one's hindering you, is there? observed the young man. What price? Uh, Twenty-five cents. The young man ran his eye over a portion of the pigeonholes and announced, Single rooms at that price all gone. The best room is fifty cents. You've got it? That's too much. Better go to Tom's lodging house, sneered the fellow. You'll find a fine ten-cent crowd there if that's your style. Tell you, 
If you don't mind sharing a room with a boy like yourself, I can accommodate you. Two beds? Yes. I'll take it. Pay it. Dave drew out his money. The young man grumbled about having to change a five-dollar bill, but that was soon got through with. Then he handed Dave a key with an iron strip on it that prevented lodgers from putting it in their pockets and forgetting to return it. Room 58, fourth floor, advised the young man, lounging back into his chair again. Be sure to put out your light when you go to bed. Dave climbed up two more flights of rickety stairs. The air of the place was close. One floor was divided up into as many as a hundred little bunks, and the snoring was disturbing. I wish I hadn't come here, thought Dave, but he kept on to the fourth floor, made out fifty-eight on a door, and unlocked it, and entered a room with one window. The light in the hall showed a lamp on the table. There were two narrow beds in the room, and they did not look particularly uncomfortable. When he lighted the lamp, Dave glanced over at the cot that was occupied. Near it was a chair, and over this hung some shabby garments. Dave had a plain view of the sleeping inmate of the bed, and he did not like the face at all. It had a red scar on one cheek, the hair was straggling and untidy, and, taken altogether, the boy made Dave think of a crowd of young roughs who had run up against him and tried to provoke him into a quarrel in his early midnight wanderings. Dave opened the window of his room to let in fresh air, then he undressed. He drew a chair up against his bed and folded his clothes across it. Then he blew out the light. "'Feels good to stretch out human-like once more, sure enough,' said Dave contentedly. Then he groped about on the chair until he found his coat and drew out the pocketbook belonging to Robert King, aviator. "'I want to make sure of that,' he mused my own money, too. I'll quietly put it all in the pocketbook and slip it under my pillow. Then no one can play any tricks on me without waking me up. Dave worked in the dark. He fished out the bills from his pocket, and then he got hold of the silver change he had received downstairs. It was composed mainly of dimes and nickels. Just as he was striving noiselessly to transfer the handful to the pocketbook, bang, rattle, trap, went half a dozen rolling nickels out of his hand. "'Hello, what's that?' challenged a sharp, suspicious voice, and Dave knew that the noise made by the falling coins had awakened the sleeper in the other bed. Dave was bound to answer. He slipped the pocketbook under his pillow and held tightly the coins remaining in his hand to prevent them from jingling together. "'It's me,' he replied. "'Who's me?' "'A rumor just in.' You're a boy, aren't you? Like yourself. What's your name? I did not register, replied Dave evasively. Huh. Don't want to be sociable, eh? Well, shut up, then. With a grunt, the occupant of the other cot seemed to flounce over and resume his slumbers. Dave did not like the sound of his voice any better than he had the look of his face. He hoped the fellow had not heard the coins drop on the floor. Dave reached out cautiously, groped about, managed to locate several nickels, placed these noiselessly in the pocketbook, and was glad that things had quieted down. Somehow he felt disturbed and uneasy. He knew that the place was second class and probably housed a good many rough characters. He made up his mind that he would keep awake until daylight and then go back to the railroad depot. He heard two and then three o'clock strike from some neighboring bell tower. By four o'clock, he was fast asleep. In a dreamy sort of a daze, his next waking action was lying with his eyes closed and counting seven strokes of a bell. Oh, dear, this won't do at all, cried Dave, leaping from the bed to the floor. Why, I'll miss the train to Fairfield if I don't move sharp. Hello, hello. Dave came to a standstill, poised like a statue. He stared at the chair by the side of his bed. His clothes were gone. He rubbed his eyes and looked again. In their stead, lying scattered carelessly on the floor, 
were the clothes belonging to his boy roommate. In a second, a dreadful flash of dismay and fear came to Dave's mind. He sprang at the bed he had just left and lifted the pillow quickly. Gone! All gone! he gasped, turning cold all over. I've been robbed! End of chapter 7